So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to start by suggesting that the soup and the samosas are really very good. So they are, they are really just off the charts. So, so it's a bit like Prairie Home Companion. You can't hear me. Wow. How do we make it louder, David? Well, I can swallow the mic. <laughs> I can do a little more if you'd like. Yeah. Go ahead. How's this? Better? Back in the back? Okay. So I was extolling the virtues of samosas and soup. <laughs> and my favorite black tea is Lapsang Souchong. Uh, my wife will not allow me to drink it in the house because it has a certain aroma that reminds her of when I used to work on cars as a boy. Uh, but they have that here too. So what I thought I'd do this, this afternoon is go through a little bit of the history of public health in Canada because I find since I crossed the river from the world of universities to the world of government, uh, and now as deputy minister, I find that many people don't really understand that which is the foundation of public health care in Canada. And it is not usually what most people think. In other words, it's one of those surprise moments when you go back and you describe a little bit of the history. And then I'll talk a little bit about how we do health care, and then I'll talk about Alberta's health care, and then we'll get to those pictures that there might not be enough of, but maybe they're spread around enough. Because if you don't look regularly at what's called population pyramids, and that's what those are called except for the map, uh, you miss what's happening to the demography of Alberta and then we'll link that back into the challenges that we face. And I'll do that quickly so that we have as much time for questions as possible. You can ask me any question you want at any time. You can raise your hand and interrupt me. Um, if I can't answer the question, I will tell you, sorry, I can't answer that question, rather than wing it for five minutes and have you figure out that I can't answer the question. So. We'll start. The first piece of legislation that anticipated what is now the Canadian healthcare system was the Constitution Act of 1865. And the important piece of the Act in 1865 is that it is largely silent on who's responsible for healthcare. Because in 1865, it was not the major concern of government that which we call healthcare. But that was the first major piece that established what is now modern, modern Canada. 1946 in Saskatchewan, uh, we have the first piece of provincial legislation that started the sequence of events that gave rise to what is now the Canadian health system. And in 1946, it's called the Saskatchewan Hospitalization Act. And it dealt largely with care in hospitals. It was very narrowly focused. It talked about people having a right to a certain small basket of care delivered in entities then called hospitals. Other provinces began to emulate what Saskatchewan did. The last piece of legislation that defines public health in Canada is the 1984 Canada Health Act and in Canada Health Act, there were a number of provisions established, uh, most notably that it was universal coverage for all Canadians, and that there could be no user fees for extra billing. So hang on to the word universal, and no user fees or extra billing, because those two characteristics have been the focus of a lot of debate back and forth. So what does universal really mean? Well, the characteristics that have come to be accepted as the key pieces of the Canadian healthcare system, there's five of them, publicly administered, comprehensive, universal, 
portable and accessible, but only as it relates to things that happen in hospitals and care delivered by physicians and surgeons. So universal means hospitals, physicians and surgeons. Public administration in Canada now is what I would like to call intensely public as opposed to somewhat public because in the UK a public system it is public because the government in the UK establishes, well now it's the English health system because there's the English system, the Scottish system, and the Welsh system. They set the price, but they don't require that the delivery, the provision, be public. So if you, end, if, if you need a hip or a knee replacement in England, chances are it will be installed by a network of private hospitals. As there's a network, a very successful network of private hospitals in England that have dominated, come to dominate the hip and knee replacement business, that's what they do. They do hips and knees and they do it really very well. They accept the price set by the National Health Service, but they are a private delivery. So if you look at healthcare as a combination of purchaser, government purchases healthcare on behalf of the population and providers, those who deliver the health care. In Canada, we have largely insisted that both the purchaser and the provider be public within the framework of the Canada Health Act, which focuses on hospitals and doctors. Okay? So, much of everything else that you might think of as health care is not covered by the Canada Health Act and there's an awful lot of variability province to province to province. Alberta, it turns out, has the richest basket or bundle of goods and services paid for by the public treasury. Alberta covers air evacuation, for example. Other provinces do not. So, public administration and public delivery, comprehensive, but only within the definition of hospitals and doctors, universal, you can take that anywhere in Canada, but only as defined by the Canada Health Act. So you might remember the headlines a little while ago, um, a resident of Alberta, a woman found herself in Northern Ontario and she had a pregnancy medical emergency Ontario was not going to pay for the cost of moving her to the hospital. But she was from Alberta, so she said, wait a minute. If I'm in Alberta, they pay for it, so why won't Alberta pay for it? Alberta's answer is we have a treaty with Ontario. The concept that you have treaties between provinces confuses a lot of people who aren't from Canada. But we do, and since we pay for Ontarians in Alberta, but Al Ontario doesn't pay for Albertans in on Ontario, she wasn't going to get paid for, but now we're negotiating an addendum to the treaty so that everybody will. And I heard just recently the baby's doing really very, very well, so, <clears throat> which is the point of this. Mother's doing well, baby's doing well, and the great big bureaucracy takes a step forward to a more genuine form of universal. Portable, this is really important. Government of Canada has a bargain with people, government of Alberta has a bargain with people that live in Alberta, and it's not written down anywhere except by action, that regardless of where you live in Alberta, the government's commitment is that you will have access to comparable health care in a reasonable time as if you lived in Edmonton or Calgary. So that's why AHS owns a fleet of helicopters and planes, and we have 109 hospitals for a population of about four and a half million people. Portable, no matter where you are in Alberta, you can expect within reasonable time to have access to high quality healthcare. And accessible, again, wherever you are, in fairly quick order, you have access to healthcare. 
So this is important because Albertans often talk about we have the highest cost health care on a per capita basis in Canada. Canada has the highest cost publicly funded health care in the OECD world, which means Alberta, we really do overachieve since we're the highest province in the country that is the highest country by public treasury in the OECD world, okay, which is different than saying the highest per capita cost all in. That would be the United States. So how much does it really cost? We put about 11% of our gross domestic product into health care. That's on the high side. That's the Canadian number at about $4,000 per capita. Alberta's per capita number is about $5,300, depending on how you count. So one of the questions, as we encounter oil at $32 a barrel, and the recent forecast is that it will stay there for about three years, because that's how long it'll take Saudi Arabia to run out of money, is why is it so expensive? $1,200 on a base of 4,000, that's a big gap, percentage-wise, times four and a half million. I don't do zeros real good standing in front, but someone can sort it out. That's a lot of money. And as we face the fiscal crunch, usually people will jump to the conclusion, oh, well, that's because we pay all of our health care providers way too much money. That's the myth. And I find in healthcare, as I cross the river, that there is a distribution of decisions. On one side is what I call passion heavy evidence light, and on the other side is what I call evidence heavy passion light. Usually you want to be at least the evidence heavy end of the distribution, but I find that a lot of what gets reported about healthcare in Alberta is unfortunately more to the passion-heavy evidence light. So if you ask many people, why do you think we spend $1,200 a person more, they'll say healthcare professionals get paid too well. Our healthcare professionals do get paid well. By the way, bureaucrats in the ministry are not considered to be healthcare professionals. <laughs> We're considered to be something special. We're known as officials. So the experts, though, say only about 20% of that gap can be attributed to wages and benefits to healthcare professionals. So what about the other $900? Well, remember, Alberta pays for more than most other provinces. And we're working on sort of lining that up because there's going to have to be a very broad-based, very public discussion come January as we get ready for the 1617 budget because there's just the money's not there uh, so that's where David go to David's point health care needs a public debate and once we identify why we have a high per capita cost then the question to Alberta and their government leaders do we like this do we want it and if we do want it how are we going to pay for it so do we want to continue to provide all of the goods and services that we currently provide? Do we want to continue to pay for medic evacuation, fixed wing and or helicopter from anywhere in Alberta to the six major third and fourth level hospitals that are in Edmonton and Calgary? And by the way, we also serve most of Northwest Territories, half of Yukon, part of Northern British Columbia, and the western corner of Nunavut. And on a bad day, the upper part of Saskatchewan, because we have better helicopters than they do. <laughs> so that's, that's part of the challenge. What do we provide? How do we pay for it? Do we want to continue to pay for it in a period of fiscal restraint? The good news is that we have a lot of money in health care and there's a long list of things that various people suggest we can do that will reduce the rate of increase in healthcare without compromising 
and in some cases actually improving dramatically quality of care. I'll give you one example. <clears throat> when I was a real academic, I was playing around with geographic information systems and you, we now call them GPS. But in 1980, I wrote some of the early code that is now embedded in your GPS stuff. So I've been following integrated databases for a very long time. And while I cannot figure out how to program those silly things in the dashboard, that's what Ellen does, um, I can write the algorithms that actually finds the way from A to B. Uh, we have in Alberta invested a um, remarkable amount of money in creating what is largely considered to be the best collection of healthcare anywhere in the English speaking world. The challenge we have is that we have done it piece by piece. So we have an amazing pharmacy information system, but it doesn't talk to an amazing laboratory information system, and they don't talk to an amazing medical imaging information system. But the big one is that the rich data that is in your physician offices on your electronic, their electronic medical records does not easily flow to the hospitals. So the estimate is that 20 or 25 percent of all of the lab tests and imaging done in the emergency rooms in Alberta would be unnecessary if you arrived with your data already there. Now these are not problems in computing science, these are not problems in data, these are not problems in encryption, these are problems in the bureaucracy we have set up to protect the privacy of your information in various little, I call them data buckets. So if we can fix the rules so that all of the information attached to David is in a little digital box called David, and that anywhere David goes in the Alberta system, if he has, or the physician has, access to David, then they pull up David. And if David, David would never go to emergency room, but let's say he did just to test his data bucket, then they would have everything on David that was ever created anywhere in Alberta in any part of the healthcare system at the disposal of the emergency room physician. And I would be arrested shortly thereafter. <laughs> Depends on how you talk to the physician. <laughs> but I, I admit you do look scary. Right, so, but we don't do profiling in Alberta hospitals. Promise. So that's, that's the challenges we face. We have a new government. We have a government that does not feel obligated to defend everything that's happened in the last 40 years. We have a government that is willing to try new stuff. We have a government that has a different view of health budgeting. And we have a government, and if you hear our minister, she will talk about the right care at the right time in the right place by the right team of professionals with the right information. Okay. So she started with four R's. The data weenie that is her deputy minister convinced her that there's really five R's because you can't do the first R unless the information is in the hands of the team when they need it, where they need it. So we're like right now four and a half R's. She hasn't, she hasn't sanctioned the fifth R yet, but she's wearing out. It's relentless. So, so that's, that's the framework. What, what does it look like in Alberta? Here's the geographer speaking. Remember, I used to teach demography. Uh, the area of Alberta is about 10% larger than the area of France. We have four and a half million people. France has 70 million or so. The population density of Alberta is five and a half people per square kilometer including Edmonton and Calgary, 2.63 people per square kilometer, excluding Edmonton and Calgary. So call it rest of Alberta. France, 118 people per square kilometer. China, 142 people per square kilometer. So remember universal, remember accessible, remember portable, 
and think about 2.63 people per square kilometer. If they need an MRI, they got to get an MRI. Okay. So Alberta is trying to do something with its healthcare system, and it's a fantastic thing to do. But we're up against a density of population <coughs> with increasingly technologically based medicine, technology that is not easily portable. Remember the old fluoroscope? How many people here might read? You'd go to the doctor's office, there'd be this thing, he'd twist your arm, stick it behind there and say, yeah, that's broken. Uh, and now, medical imaging doesn't happen in family physician offices anymore. It's not just x-rays, it's MRIs, it's CT scans, and it's an amazing array of technology, but that technology is in fewer and fewer places. But it's accessible, healthcare, it's portable, it's universal. You need it, we gotta get you there. So Alberta, in fact, is delivering a quality of healthcare in a population density unlike most of the rest of the world. And China has the Gobi Desert, big and it's empty, they have the high plains of Mongolia, the government's moved all the people to the city so they're big and empty, has the high plains of Tibet. Scandinavian countries, they have all that big empty space. Alberta doesn't have a lot of big empty space. We have a lot of space with a very low population density, but we don't have a lot of big empty space. So we do have to cover an area the size of France with a population density that is a fraction of what France provides. So that's, that's the big challenge as we get into fiscal restraint. So to the pretty pictures, and I'm done. The first slide, slide is a picture of population density. I'm a geographer. I was trained as a cartographer. Uh, you're not paying me, so you're gonna get a map. <laughs> the next page. That's the only reason it's there. Is it? I get to say it's a map. Population pyramid, if you haven't done population pyramids before, one side is male, one side is female. Uh, the gradations from bottom to top are age groups. There's three bars on each graph. Let's look at the north zone. Uh, Alberta Health Service has five zones. Everything north of Edmonton, Edmonton, Calgary, everything south of Calgary, and everything between Edmonton and Calgary. That's the central zone. So if you look at the north zone, look at males. The bars are today 2013. The interior line is 2003. The exterior line is a forecast for 2023. So when I was a professor in 13 weeks, we would do population pyramids like you wouldn't believe it. So you're gonna to get to three minute lesson. Uh, talk to U of A, maybe they'll give you a credit for the course. <laughs> to be a very sustainable healthcare system demographically, you want a very fat bottom, a very thin top, and you want a fairly easy gradation from bottom to top. At the top to the bottom, that's called the dependency, young people, old people, and the bulge in the middle pay for the young people and the old people. If the bottom shrinks, then you don't have young people to grow up to be middle-aged people to pay for the old people. Okay? So that's our challenge. We are increasing the top. You can see males 2023 are older than males 2013, the magic of a population pyramid. Once you're born, you're there until you die. So you can see the bulge moving up, and the bulge will become dependent on what's below, but if there's nobody at the bottom, then by the time the bulge becomes old, there's fewer and fewer people to pay the bills. And if you were to look at Japan's population pyramid, it looks like this. Nobody at the bottom, 
almost everybody at the top, and they have no idea how they're going to make it work. And they don't do immigration. So when you see Germany, which has a population pyramid becoming Japan-like, receive thousands and thousands of refugees, it's a magnificent humanitarian gesture, and it is fundamentally changing their population pyramid. So that's the North Zone. You can look at the Central Zone, also rural, except for Red Deer. Between Edmonton and Calgary, you see a similar pattern. And then you look at Calgary and Edmonton. Calgary and Edmonton, that looks okay, except for the bottom. So even in Calgary and Edmonton, you begin to see that the bottom is shrinking. So we have two choices. We either make a whole bunch more babies real fast, and that would be talking to those less than 65, I think. Or, as we have for the last several years, we import a lot of people. And the energy sector was a magnificent importing device until recently. It brought a lot of young people from Newfoundland. It brought a lot of young people from the rest, rest of Canada. brought a lot of young people from everywhere in the world. Our future, look at the South Zone. Last page. As your population pyramid becomes vertical, you're in real serious trouble. In a publicly funded healthcare system, because the top plus the bottom is twice the size of the middle. And you're not manufacturing the middle anymore. Now, the fact that this is the south zone of Alberta isn't a huge challenge except from a population density point of view. But if all of Alberta looks like this, then we have a real serious sustainability problem, not just in healthcare, but all of civil society. Because the tax base, those who pay taxes, is half the size of those who are consuming the taxes. Okay? So that's the big demographic transition. In other words, we have an aging population, and the healthcare system loves their special numbers. So remember the two numbers, 5, 65. 5% 5 of the population in Alberta consumes 65% of the health care budget. And the health care budget is 50%, actually 48% of everything the government of Alberta spends. So 5% of the population, gets a little tricky here, consumes two-thirds of 50% of everything the government of Alberta spends. And that 5% turns over at the rate of 70% per year. So your residency time in the 5% on average is less than two years. That means you die. But that 5% consumes 65%. That's the seniors group. It's not surprising. The second largest component in the 5% are the very ill young people who have extremely complex health issues that require very large and expensive intervention. But if that's the piece of your demography that is growing most rapidly, those over 65 and the effort, the suggestion, the suggestion is over 65 doubles in the next 20 years and over 90 triples in the next period of time. 565 if the population is shifting to an older age cohort, then 5% starts growing, and 65% starts growing. And that's a big challenge for us. So, not to be depressed, seriously, because the optimistic 
end of this is that there are many, many things that other systems in our demographics uh, position, especially the Scandinavian countries, have done to remedy the 565, to dramatically reduce the reliance on hospitals, to much more tightly couple primary care in the community, in the home. There are many, many things we don't do, but that we could do to allow people to remain in their homes for much longer periods than they currently do. There are things we can do to much better utilize pharmaceuticals and biologics. There's an estimate that 20 or 30 percent of the pharmaceuticals that are consumed and paid for by the government are not really addressing the issues that they're designed to address. There's evidence that because we don't connect the primary health care information with the pharmacy information that a lot of people don't take the drugs that they need to take so they become critical and then they go to the hospital and they're part of the 565. So there are systems where physician writes a prescription, they don't actually write them anymore, they come out of a computer. That prescription is recorded and sent to the pharmacy information database. The pharmacy information database reports back to the physician if it's not filled in a stipulated period of time. And if it's not renewed in a stipulated period of time, also it goes back to the physician because that means you're not taking them. And for example, high blood pressure pills. If you don't take them when you're supposed to take them, then sooner or later something much more complicated is going to happen. And there are digital solutions to a lot of these situations that are not invasive, that do not invade privacy, and they can help bring down the cost of the acute care interventions. So we have a lot of money in healthcare system. The trick in the next 18 to 24 months is to be very diligent in making those changes that allow it to become a much more efficient system so that we do not degrade the quality of care even as we bring down the escalation in the cost of health care. So I'm optimistic. That's why I took the job. And uh, there's an awful lot of goodwill and there's an awful lot of smart people out there. So it's not even close to an urgent crisis kind of situation. But we don't have a lot of time. And when oil was $100 a barrel, we probably had more time than we have with oil at $32 a barrel. Uh, so it's time to get busy.